Good afternoon. Uh, first off, thank to uh, all the members of the uh, Programming Committee for the opportunity to present today. Um, uh, as was stated, my name is Brandon Ewing. I am a network automation engineer at IMC Trading here in Chicago. I've been designing, deploying, and uh, designing, deploying, and operating networks for a little over 20 years now and uh, talking publicly about them for a little over 40 seconds. So uh, thank you all <laughs> for your patience. Okay. The title of my talk today is uh, Reducing, uh, is the 16-bit data center. Today we're going to be talking about reducing complexity in data center configurations. Uh, when I say the complexity of data center uh, configurations, what we talked about before is uh, using a single source of truth as, a, as, a as a something that guides what your devices look like afterwards. So what we're going to focus on is reducing the amount of pieces of information that we have to collect and place into that source of truth in order to configure any given item in your data center. Um, the goal today is um, uh, to configure any device in a toy data center with only 16 bits of data. Um, I do try to be vendor agnostic in everything that I do, but uh, all the examples in this, exist, uh, in, this, uh, in this presentation are going to be in Arista Ease because that's what I've been working with for the longest time. So a quick note about the, to uh, to uh, the contents of this talk. About 40% of this is knowledge transfer. I do hope everyone learns something today. Uh, about 40% of this is stuff to think about. I haven't really come up with any new original ideas here today, but I am combining a lot of them together. Um, I do hope this makes you think about and talk with each other. Uh, Alex absolutely will, if you talk to him about what I say about IPv6 today, will give you his, his thoughts, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, on that note, the last 20% of this talk is please tell me he's not doing that in production. Um, this is a toy data center. Uh, I am doing lots of really goofy stuff with bit shifts and math. Um, your staff probably would not be able to support it. So do think about it, but don't deploy it. Okay, so when we're talking about complexity, it helps first to start with simplicity. Uh, you're staring at a green field. You have a, a simple bill of materials in front of you. You get to go out and build an entirely fresh data center with a single vendor and a single set of items, and everything just works fine. So in that kind of data center, um, uh, you, know, you have a single architect who decided what types of configurations and technologies you're going to be using. Almost all the configuration is going to be exactly identical. However, time passes. Your team rotates in and out. New technologies become available. Uh, your hardware vendor might um, uh, stop producing a platform, you might switch hardware vendors entirely, or you might not be able to get the hardware platform of your choice simply due to supply chain issues. So over time, your single data center starts to look like a collection of disparate data centers with different vendors at different levels and different pieces of equipment. So today we're talking about complexity in the data center. How do we measure it? Well, to start with, at a, at a one remove, if we just look at the configuration of a given device inside your data center, say this leaf router in our first data center that we talked about, and we compare that configuration to the configuration of a different device, same vendor here, doing the exact same role deployed at a later date, how different are the configs really? Um, using some historical data of uh, device configs at an unnamed company that I have access to, we can look at a real world example of about a 2,000 line configuration, pretty simple, but over 600 lines of these config are different. That's like 25% of configuration is pretty different. That's a lot of complexity that we have to manage. So a couple of baseline rules for this little thought experiment that I'm doing today. Uh, I am going to be using templates for all of my configuration. Uh, it really doesn't matter what template, templating language you use. I'm going to be using Go templates today from uh, Container Lab. Uh, if you do, when you're working with templates, it's always best to um, use the same templates for provisioning and configuration. It's not very great if you, if you deploy them one way and try and support them another. Um, if you aren't comfortable pushing configs via automation, you should at least be doing audits of your configuration so you can track drift away from your desired ideal. And finally, as you rotate architects, technologies, and um, uh, uh, different route maps and things of that nature, make sure that you are cleaning up after yourself and your configs. Otherwise, you're just leaving landmines uh, for future you. So since we're working with templates, um, uh, we're going to start with a context. So we've successfully taken all that uh, complexity out of the configuration, the device configuration itself and moved it into a domain-specific language. So we're making progress already. Um, so in this um, uh, very simple, very fake uh, context that we have for configuring a device, it's just a single device. And you know we have some information about the host name, what that host is doing. There's information about addressing, uh, routing protocols configured on it, and things like uh, AAA and DNS. Well, this is a lot better than um, 400 different lines of configuration. This file is still about 608 bytes, and uh, 608 bytes is still well higher of our goal of 16 bits of information. So we've got some work ahead of us. So let's start with boilerplate. Um, uh, I'm highlighting here uh, two different devices. We could say this, the two same devices that we looked at in the diff in the first place. We've got some uh, snippets here and a side-by-side -side diff. 
Um, when I talk about boilerplate, it's all the stuff that you need on a network that uh, is pretty much should be the same everywhere. Um, uh, things like uh, DNS services, uh, AAA services, uh, management configuration, out of band configuration. You should try and make this as standardized and uh, standardize and track that across all of your devices as much as you can. So in our bad example here, We've got a couple devices in different data centers that are using different sets of name servers to perform uh, name resolution, and uh, our TACAC servers are in a random order because someone typed them in in a random order, depending on where they were in the globe at the time. Some of these problems are easily solvable. Um, if you uh, have support from your application team, you can use Anycast for services. This means that you don't have to have different sets of IPs for different services in different locations. If you're able to use some of the same IP for your service, that's one less thing you have to track and configure on your device. So we can use Anycast wherever possible, but if you are using Anycast, you have to make sure to use it wisely. Your application has to be smart enough to remove itself from uh, consideration if it's not in a healthy state. And uh, you, should, you should place your Anycast points that you are, so that you are not doing ECMP between two of them from a single location on your network. That can have real problems if you're doing things with AAA uh, authorization sessions or things of the like that uh, expect you to keep talking to the same server all the time. If you're not comfortable uh, using Anycast, that's fine. You can use global services. Just try and make sure that you're keeping it all in the same order. Uh, if RTT is important because you truly are global, uh, you can programmatically order them uh, in your template logic, but then you're really just moving complexity out of your context and into your template, which is good if you're not managing the templates, but bad if you are. So now that we've talked about that, we can look back to our context. Uh, we've uh, successfully eliminated all the information about DNS and uh, AAA, but um, uh, one of the things that hops out to me immediately is um, uh, we've got some repeated information here. We have uh, the same uh, piece of information, specifically the loopback IP, in multiple locations in our context. We've got uh, an IP, an IPv4 address in our loopback zero, and it's also the same on the router ID. Programmers have a saying called, don't repeat yourself. If you have the same piece of information, you should really only write it down and use it once. So instead of um, uh, having the IP twice in our, uh, in our configuration, we should just use our template to uh, place it, the one piece of information in the second part. Another thing we can do is look at what information we can derive from other pieces of information. Do we really need to write and track both an IPv4 and IPv6 loopback? Not really. If we know, if we have a set of ranges for IPv6 loopbacks, we can just take the 32-bit IPv4 address, combine it with our IPv6 address, and generate something that we no longer have to write down and track in our context. So in this example, we take uh, the slash 64 plus the slash 32. We've got a couple of different ways of representing this, depending on what type of vendor you are working with. Back to our context. So now that we've got that removed, we got the router ID moved up into our top level context. We're not storing that down in our BGP ASN. Things are starting to look a little bit cleaner. We're almost like halfway done here. We've got uh, a couple of things down. So what can we look at next? Well, we still have a couple of pieces of repeated information. We've got the host name, the region, the role. Um, Anyone who's actually seen Richard Steenberger's talk on uh, BGP informational communities uh, or just read the slides probably knows where I stole my next idea from. Let's talk about what a router ID really is. Well, it's a 32-bit it's a number. It's, a, it's a, a set of four bytes, and we can see the loopback that I've randomly chosen displayed here. If we take the top 16 bits and throw them away and just look at the bottom 16 bits, we can see what if we, in, what if we um, uh, encode information about what this device does into the, router, it's, into the router ID itself. So if we use two bits for the region, two bits for the site, two bits to represent what layer this device is at, we still have 10 whole other bits we can use to uniquely identify this device in our network. So in this example, we have a uh, leaf device in our first data center. I would like to point out, top right there, this is the 20% part. If your operations staff can't do bitwise math in their head, they probably shouldn't be supporting this. Beyond that, uh, we talked about BGP informational communities. We can do this with the ASN too. And ASN is, uh, if you use a four byte ASN, it's a 16 bit number and a 16 bit number. We have so much space in the first half, we can actually nicely encode the region, site, and layer into the first half of the ASN, um, uh, just uh, with single decimal digits that your support staff would actually be able to read. And then use the last 16 bits just to encode the 16 bits that we talked about earlier in its decimal form. Let's go through a couple of examples of this because um, uh, I, it might be difficult to do the math in your head. I used a calculator. So for our original uh, device here, it's uh, the uh, leaf in region zero. We can see that the, uh, the region bits are zero, zero. The site bits are zero, zero. 
The layer bit is 0, 1, meaning it's a layer 1 device. This is a leaf device. So the, the upper half of our ASN is uh, 65001. The second half there, we take four. Um, uh, the, um, uh, first ha the, uh, first bite of the, uh, the first byte of our 16 bits and bit shift that to the right eight times. Um, uh, basically, it's two to the eighth multiplied by four. And add on that final 10, we get our final ASN of 65001.1034. Another example, a super spine in a different data center in region three. Well, our region is three. So we've got a region bit of one, one. Our site is still zero, so the bits there are zero, zero. And a layer three, uh, a la I'm sorry, a super spine is, a layer, is layer three in our model here. So that's uh, one, one on the bits. So our ASN for uh, the uh, region three super spine that we're talking about here is 65303. And then the bottom half of that is, again, the 72 that you see in the loop back uh, that I've listed at the top right, times 256, bit shifted, bit shifted over um, eight bits and then add on that 75 for a final ASN of 65303, 18507. Why 16 bits? Well, I'll be honest, I came up with the title of this talk before I had any of the slides whatsoever. It allowed me to spend at least a day and a half looking at, um, uh, looking at, um, uh, bit, uh, looking at emojis, emojis and old video, game, uh, old video game screenshots. So it was, I thought, a good choice. Second reason is we still want to maintain IPv4 reachability using our IPv4 loopbacks. Um, given that we're trying to use um, uh, routable addresses in the private range, um, 16 bits seems like a nice, nice compromise. We can still have 172.18, which is my example for our uniqueness, and then those last 16 bits for reachability. If you don't care about IPv4 at all, you can feel free to use the entire 32-bit router ID and encode whatever weird bit shifting you want to in your scheme. Uh, but be aware that BGP 4 byte ASNs only have about 25 bits of private address space, so you'd probably have to come up with a little bit of compression or maybe just limit yourself to uh, the 25 bits. And again, please don't do this in production. Going back, we can see that we now um, uh, eliminated the ASN of ourselves um, in a lot of the loopback addresses. So all we have configured left on our, all we have left in our context is um, uh, the actual uh, IPv4 and IPv6 addresses configured on the point-to-point -point interfaces between our devices and our BGP policy. We still have to be able to say, hey, I'm a peer with this guy at this ASN on, on this IP. So going back to our side-by-side -side to look at the devices in the real world, uh, we can see um, uh, the interfaces themselves. Um, uh, there is descriptions. Um, in terms of uh, whether or not you want to put descriptions in your context, operationally, it's up to your team. Some people prefer LODP to look at this information. Other people like to actually have it available if they're logging into a device. If you have data center crew that log into your devices to look at output or looking at stored configs, this information can be useful. Also could just automate a process that goes out, looks at your LLDP and automatically configures your descriptions. Then you don't have to have that in your context anymore. Looking at this, I'm still seeing more repetition. So each interface, we're looking at the two different devices here. There's a, the, a leaf in one data center and a leaf in a different one. Uh, each one of them has an IPv4 address and an IPv6 address. Uh, just for this one link, this, this one spine, you have an IPv4 and an IPv6 neighbor for this one link to this one spine. Again, we're repeating ourselves. Well, you don't have to do that. RFC 5549, and if you go to the slide later, that is a link, you can click on it, it will tell you the text of the RFC, allows you to exchange IPv4 reachability over IPv6 BGP peerings. So what does that mean? It means that we can no longer need those IPv4 BGP peerings at all. We can remove them completely from our configuration and our context and still maintain IPv4 and IPv6 reachability. And since we're not doing our IPv4 peerings anymore, we really don't even need the IPv4 addresses on those point-to-point -point interfaces. So now all we have configured here is our IPv6 address on this point-to-point -point link and the BGP neighbor on the other side along with his ASN. I really don't like using IPAMs, especially for point-to-point -point links. I'm just really bad at Excel. So what you can do instead is just not use globally unique addresses anywhere. Uh, dra uh, there is a, um, a standard that's widely supported. There's an internet draft that's been deployed by many vendors, uh, it's uh, common on the big three, that allows you to use link local addresses to set up BGP peerings. Um, there is a, a new uh, a internet draft that's linked in this talk that also discusses this and kind of tries, is trying to formalize what's been done across those vendors at this time. It standardizes pretty much this practice of not having to use uh, unique addresses for BGP peerings. So now we don't need any globally unique addressing at all. 
In fact, all you, you don't even need to think about the local addresses on these. If you can come up with schemes like, um, I'm a spine, I'll just have all my leaf-facing interfaces be colon one. And I'm a leaf, I'll just have all my spine interfaces be colon zero. That way, you can just encode that in your template logic, and you don't need to worry about it anymore. So you can see in our configuration, we've just got a, sin a single address for all of our interfaces across all of our devices, and a single peer that we're still assigning our, BGP, our neighbor's BGP ASN to. A note on BGP peer auto detection. It still sucks that I have to figure out, I have to manually encode the IP of the guy on the other side of my peering. Uh, there is work being done in the IETF working group on a couple of methods of exchanging information between BGP routers to automatically configure BGP. I've got a link here to a, 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 a write-up that Randy Bush did on a couple of the different methods as they're working through this process. Uh, some of them are layer two. They work on LODP messages via an extension I'm, uh, with a new TLV. Some are layer three and are designed to be secure and inter-vendor, I'm sorry, inter-AS and actually allow you to set up multi-hop BGP connections. Some are stateful, some are stateless. There's no real consensus yet on how many of these are going to be moving forward. Uh, they're, trying to support all D, they're trying to support all BGP use cases. They're, I, they're the IETF. They're, they just try and do stuff like that. It looks like at least one, if not uh, two or three, are probably going to be move, moving forward in the RFC, but I haven't seen anything new uh, out of the working group on this since, I believe, July. Fortunately, uh, we have the simplest use case. We have uh, two routers we control on either side of a point-to-point -point link. There is a technology, well, uh, there is a technology called IPv6 Link Local Peer Auto Detection. It uses IPv6 router advertisements to figure out what the IP of a BGP speaker on the other end of a point-to-point -point link is. There's no RFC or internet draft for this, but at least two um, hardware vendors and multiple software vendors do support it in one fashion or another. They're still trying to work out all the bugs, so there may be interoperability issues, but now I don't need to put any addresses on any of my interfaces. I just say IPv6 enable, let the, e, uh, let the uh, auto-generated address take care of it. We do have to specify what interface we are peering on and what policy and what AS is on the other side of that interface, but there are some helpful hints for that too. Neighbors can specify AS ranges on uh, the platforms that I have found that support IPv6 link local auto detection. You can say, hey, I expect uh, NAS of this range to be on this interface. If it shows up, go ahead and establish the dynamic peering and start exchanging routing information. We still do have to statically, uh, statically map a BGP policy to each interface though. So in this case, on a spine, well, we know from, our, uh, from how we plan things that on a spine, interfaces uh, one through 48 are going to be facing leaves uh, if we look at a fixed, uh, fixed to you unit that has um, a, a downlink block and an uplink block. And then the upper block are all going to be uh, in a different set of ASNs with a different peer filter that uh, says we will be applying a different policy to them. Um, it's very easy to predict this in my lab because I can control where all the links are, but uh, production usually is not as nice. Things break, there are exceptions, so you would have to be able to handle exceptions in whatever uh, configuration context you are using. If your virtualization and tenancy model supports this, we can even extend this concept down to the hosts themselves. If you want to do a completely layer three routed data center, we can, assign, we can assign router IDs to all the hosts in your data center. You can do this via your deployment or burn-in. Uh, you could even think up a, a custom DHCP daemon that actually would assign these addresses. Uh, this allows a software running on the host to actually discover its own neighbors, establish the peerings, and advertise their own reachability throughout the data center. Um, both GoBGP and FRR support IPv6 link local auto detection and will automatically establish uh, peerings on any detected peer if configured appropriately. This allows you to uh, basically take a, a given server, attach it to one or more leaves, or attach the same server to the same leaf multiple times, and it will automatically configure and use all available bandwidth in ECMP. Uh, you no longer have to worry about LACP configurations, MLAG configurations, or things of that nature uh, that would cause uh, except that you might have to create exceptions for in your configuration policy. So looking at the configuration of our leaf switch, now that we've decided we're going to be doing this, we've got, got uh, two peer groups defined. We uh, establish uh, what interfaces those peer groups are going to be on. We activate the address families for both, and uh, just uh, the traffic works. What really sucks is that I still do have to assign a policy to an interface. It would be really cool if um, uh, you could just say in your configuration, hey, whatever ASN, he tell whatever ASN your peer tells you, yeah, just trust it and give it the appropriate policy. We've already established a scheme to say um, uh, we, can, we can already uh, figure out who's on the other side of it by looking at, the first three, looking at the first 16 bits of our ASN in my scheme. 
if the um, uh, looking, you can tell if a device is in your region, outside of your region, if this is a WAN link, and you can tell which layer, uh, which layer you're connecting to based on its ASN. So you would be able to set up peer filters uh, that have ASN ranges that identify exactly what policy, and then you wouldn't even need to uh, specify what interfaces are used for policy and just let them find each other's. Um, I've asked my vendors to support this, and I would appreciate it if you would too. Obviously, if you're going to go doing things like uh, trusting other people's ASNs telling you um, exactly what's going on, uh, you should probably look at better security. TCP AO, uh, which is uh, an improvement on TCP MD5, it can be used to uh, basically allow key rotation. It's basically modern uh, authentication for BGP sessions. So to recap, we've eliminated all of the boilerplate. Um, uh, we're using templates for anything. We're using any cast to make sure all of that works through well. Um, we've taken that 16, we've taken that 32-bit router ID taken 16 bits of it, and use that to derive almost everything else in our configuration. We removed all the non-loopback addressing, and we're using BGP between everything on the network. So looking back at our contacts, so you can see the original on the left here, which covers a single device and wouldn't even actually cover a real single, uh, cover a real single device in your network. And on the right, configuration for an entire toy, toy data center with just 16 bits per node. I have two demos. I hope. Here we go. So the first one, uh, and this code is all available on GitHub. Feel free to clean it, follow along. The complete talk is there as well. Uh, I've got a quick Golang program that um, uh, uses a router ID to generate complete configs for my lab environment. So if I build this using Go real quick, I can use this program, pipe in a router ID. We'll use the one we've been using for the example, 4.10, generate a quick text file. Do it again, but uh, for a different router ID in a different data center uh, performing the same role, uh, 100.48. Take a quick look at it just so you can kind of see what's inside it there. It's pretty standard configuration. Some management boilerplate that we talked about before. Our loopbacks are there now. Just, uh, yeah, the interface is just no switchboard. Put uh, IPv6 on them. I've just cheated and said, just any private ASN, I'll accept the peer. Assign our, uh, assign our policies to our interfaces as appropriate, and the rest of the BGP boilerplate, some multicast boilerplate, because hi, I work in trading. So calling back to the original diff we did, let's take a look at what the differences are between these two files that I've generated. That's uh, seven, seven differences across about 200 lines config. Take a look at the actual diff itself, you can see it's Host name changes, loop back changes, ASNs change. And here at the end, that's basically just a 32-bit representation of the router ID for the uh, multipath, multipath stuff. Okay, got one more. Yeah. What, are the, what does it look like actually uh, trying to troubleshoot such a data center? Well, uh, we can use Container Lab to build a quick lab from these generated configs. So, if you have Container Lab available, you can clone this, download it, and spin up a quick lab. Uh, we've got uh, a pretty toy data center. It's two spines, three leaves, four hosts. Get them all connected real quick. Uh, wait for the uh, configs to finish loading. Okay. Now, we can take a look. We can hop into one of the hosts that we have connected to the leaf, uh, 0 0.5. Hop into FRR, take a look at the, uh, the routing table, such as it were. Uh, we can see we've got uh, the, it's one peer, two address families. It shows us two there. We can take a look at the BGP v4 pass. We have connectivity to every other host in the network. IPv6, connectivity to every other loop back in the network. And verify that with a quick ping. And also it's just trace route via real quick v6 to prove we've got connectivity with both. All right, from there we can hop into one of the leaves and take a look at what it looks like uh, from the router side. Again, look at our BGP pairings real quick. Uh, this may look a little bit different and harder to support uh, for your operation staff if you're not used to dynamic pairings. But we still have reachability to uh, all of the loopback addresses and can see the AS pass, which uh, are pretty easy to read when we have our scheme. And finally, the BGP stuff. Again, uh, 
Thank you all. That is uh, pretty much the end of my presentation. All of this code is available on GitHub. Uh, I will be here uh, for the uh, meet and greet uh, by the IMC table if anyone wants to talk anything more about this. So thank you all very much.